left. He said we're gonna we're gonna go extinct. I th it might have been a hundred or so If he generations. said that, I didn't read it because I he did. Um, Maybe I would I would be like the scientist who uh, <laughs> Gore tried to quote in Copenhagen, and, and the scientist said, "That's not me. I would never say anything like that." Okay. So. Well, well, in any <laughs> case, he did. But in in any case, I wanted to make one final comment. And we'll go to this section of film, which is eight and a half minutes long, and then we'll come back to talk with you guys. And by the way, those phone numbers. If you're watching tonight, June nineteenth, two thousand and ten, uh, you can call us. And we'd be happy to discuss anything relating to spiritual, philosophical, scientific issues relating to all these things. May I do one more, Michael? M one second. I'm going to put, get okay. my last one in. Okay. It, with that Y chromosome, I wanted to finish with that thought, and then Vern's thought, and then we'll go to the film. With the Y chromosome, the, the secular scientists said that the differences they're seeing between the chimp, finally they did it the right way, the chimp uh, chrom uh, gene, genes, re chromosome relating to that, the Y chromosome, and the human chromosome, there was about 50% difference of genetic material that the chimp didn't have that humans do have, about 50% in total. And so they claim that a 70% at best similarity versus the 98.5 just for that chromosome. Mm -hmm. Who knows what they're going to find in others? And they likened it to humans being coming from the same ancestor as a chicken based on that. And there aren't too many people that say that, you know, obviously, look at that chicken. We've evolved from a chicken. But genetically, from a Y chromosome perspective, it fits just as well as, as with anything, as with a chimp, to say we've, we've evolved from a chicken. You pop in your thought, and then we'll go to that film. Okay. And if I may, uh, just backing up a, a little bit, why this whole question about creation? Uh, Michael on this program, and I've, I've dropped in a couple of times, uh, focuses uh, a great deal on the question of uh, creation and the evidences for creation, for thinking people. Um, but creation is really at the, at the base. Uh, it's foundational for a belief uh, of and relationship with God. And uh, if you're a Christian, if you're an active Christian, many today might say, well, um, I believe the Bible, I believe Jesus, I believe the gospel, uh, that Jesus was Son of God, He died for us. Uh, uh, we, we need Him for salvation to be cleansed so we can live with God uh, forever. But the creation stuff, maybe I don't need to be tied into all of those details. I would like to read from the book of Revelation, and this is what an angel, flying in mid-heaven, uh, I'll have to check Michael's uh, translation, it says mid-heaven, but uh, uh, in the midst of heaven, uh, in whatever version this is. King James. In the King James Version. And just listen carefully. Um, then I saw another, I'm sorry, this is uh, Revelation, which is the last book of the Bible, which it gives God, God's revelation through John uh, to all mankind of future events. Um, and I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. So what we're going to hear the angels say is going to be, in essence, the everlasting gospel. That is the good news that is timeless. Saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to Him for the hour of His judgment is come and worship Him that made heaven and earth, the sea and the fountains of water. So the everlasting gospel, yes, it certainly includes uh, Jesus and who He is, but um, the angel flying in the midst of heaven also uh, included creation uh, as a part of this very fundamental uh, everlasting gospel. So what we're talking about now, it's more than just uh, scientific or intellectual curiosities. It has real substance of who we are and how we understand who we are, uh, how we should live, and can we have hope or no hope. You know, and adding to that, in Genesis, it says that Eve was created out of a rib of Adam. And secular science just won't accept that one. Uh, but of course, an omnipotent, omniscient God can do whatever He wants. And um, all of the uh, non-Christian or non-biblical traditions of the origin of man, if they begin somewhere, they would begin with a mother. Uh, but the Bible begins with a father of all living. And if you look, we're going to be talking about the chromosomes tonight, but uh, man has, uh, as far as the sex chromosome, the XY, the woman has uh, XX. So you can genetically get a woman from a man, but you cannot get a man from a woman. 
Uh, so the Bible uh, is the only, uh, as far as I know, creation story mm. uh, or origin story that really presents it uh, consistent with uh, what we know about the, uh, the X and Y chromosome and the things we'll be talking about tonight. And if we said, we said before, everything in the Bible fits scientifically. There's nothing that the Bible speaks about that is in error. I mean, some people would like to throw in, oh, the, says the Bible says the sun stood still, you know, when there was a big battle going on. Uh, but of course, we still say today that the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. Well, that's as scientifically wrong. It's just an expression as it is there. But of course, the Bible does say the earth was round and hangs on nothing. It doesn't say anywhere that the earth is flat or anything like that. It says it's a sphere, and that's correct. And how could they have known that it was round way back then, 2,100 yes. years before Columbus discovered America? Yes, and it says about 16 times that God stretched out the heavens. And if you've seen the picture of, uh, of, of Einstein there um, puffing on, no, it's Hubble puffing on his cigar, uh, on, on his pipe, while, while Einstein was peering through his telescope as they were discussing the red shift and the newly discovered expansion of the universe, uh, if they'd read the Bible, and maybe Einstein did and didn't get the connection, um, it's about 16 times in the Bible that God stretched out the heavens. Um, so it fits. It, it fits, yep. And we can go on and on. We'll show you this, this first clip of film. It's eight and a half minutes long, and then we'll be back to take questions, comments, and talk to you guys then. See you in eight and a half minutes chromosome 2 fusion event support human chimp ancestry. This is by far becoming the most asked question that I receive, so we need to deal with that. First of all, the facts. Humans have 46 chromosomes. That is a fact. Chimps have 48 chromosomes. That is also a fact. Banding patterns in DNA sequences on human chromosome 2 are very similar to what we find on chimp chromosomes 12 and 13. In fact, so much so, and because of people's evolutionary presuppositions, um, they have renamed chimp chromosome 12 and 13 to 2A and 2B, okay, to reflect the fact that we supposedly diverged from them. And I, there's no doubt about it that the human and chimp uh, chromosomes are very, very similar to one another. In fact, if you look here, this is human, chimp, gorilla, and orangutan. And if you look at the human and chimp, this is human chromosome 2 and 12 and 13 for the chimp. You will see they're very, very similar in their banding pattern. If you look at the sequence, it's very, very similar. So I'm not no one can deny that, really. Now, some more facts on this. If you look at human chromosome 2 right in the middle of the chromosome, you will see a couple interesting things. You'll see remnants of what are called centromeric DNA. Now, in the middle of a chromosome, you have a special kind of DNA called centromeric DNA. And human chromosome 2 not only has its one centromere, but it has remnants of another one. Right? It looks like there might be another one there. And also in the middle, you have telomeric DNA. Now, that's interesting because telomeric DNA is only found on the ends of the chromosome. It's not found in the middle. But yet on human chromosome 2, you find some of that right in the middle. So what it looks like is that two chromosomes have come together and fused, at least um, superficially speaking. That's what it looks like. So in fact, human chromosome 2 may have resulted from the fusion of two chromosomes. And so many people love this. They think this is great because, you know, chimps have 48 and we have 46. So if you're going to evolve from a chimp, you've got to lose chromosomes. You've got to lose information. And so um, the, they think that chimp chromosome 12 and 13 fused to form human chromosome 2. And many evolutionists say that this is proof of common ancestry, absolute proof that we diverge from a chimp. In fact, Dr. Ken Miller, who is a well-known theistic evolutionist, recently had this to say. Is there any question to explain these facts? And these are facts. This is not hypothesis or conjecture, the fact that human chromosome 2 is similar to 12, uh, chimp chromosome 12 and 13. Any way to explain these facts in light of the view that our species was uniquely designed or intelligently created? The answer is no. You can only explain this by evolutionary common ancestry. Wow, that's a pretty powerful term to use, only. Unfortunately, what Dr. Miller and many other evolutionists don't realize is they have committed a logical fallacy with their argument. So we're going to take a look at that, and we're going to point that out. And one of the biggest logical fallacies that I see committed, and you're going to see this several times today, is that of affirming the consequent. They say, well, if humans and chimps share a common ancestor, then we should observe a fusion event. Human chromosome 2 shows evidence of a fusion event. Therefore, humans and chimps share a common ancestor. Okay, let me put this in other terms. 